evening, everybody. This is Pastor Kumar from the Independent Bible Church in Duryea. I want to welcome you to our evening service this Sunday uh, evening, uh, May 25th. Can you believe that the month is almost gone already? We're going to have a word of prayer, uh, and uh, let's look to the Lord, shall we? Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given to us now to come together. We pray as we have this service that you will uh, touch the hearts of folks that know you as Savior, and that you will also touch the hearts of those that need Christ. We pray today uh, that they might cry out to you and that they might uh, be born again, and we'll thank you for that help. Uh, bless, Lord, in uh, this nation. We trust that by your grace that you will take us back to some normalcy. We're praying for our leadership that they might uh, do the right things, Father, put politics aside and do the right things for the uh, country, and for that we'll praise you as well. Now, guide. Uh, this evening as we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay? Okay, we're going to sing Who is on the Lord's Side tonight. If you have your Majesty hymn book at home, like to follow along, that's 392. We're going to sing now Who is on the Lord's Side, first and last stanza. chapter 23 in our Bibles tonight. I'm just going to look at one verse. I believe it's a wonderful principle in the Word of God. We'll just look at for a uh, 
challenge from the Word of God this evening. So Proverbs chapter 23, and what we'll do, we'll just uh, read the verse, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll get right into the message. All right, so the chapter of Proverbs is 23, and the verse is also verse 23. Proverbs 23, 23. The Bible says, Buy the truth, and sell it not. Also wisdom, and instruction, and understanding. Let's have a word of prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, I do ask you give me clarity in the preaching of thy word. We pray that you open up our ears and our eyes and our minds, our hearts, to receive the good seed of the word of God. Lord, we understand tonight that while teachers can teach to the mind, it takes the spirit of God to speak to the heart. And so we ask you would do a work within our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I can recall when it came time where I had gotten my first job. Now, some of you, many of you know, I've said my first job that I worked was on a farm. And, um, but some of the details, you may not know what it's quite like to work on a farm. Especially the farm I worked in was in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. A farm about 200 acres. Uh, the things that they farmed was produce. So it was corn, it was tomatoes, it was peppers, it was cucumbers, it was uh, zucchini, watermelons, cantaloupe, uh, okra. Uh, they even grew chrysanthemums. And so there was a, a variety of produce that they would grow. Uh, mainly for the consumption of food. Some things were decorative. They also raised some decorative corn for the fall. They also raised pumpkins for the fall. They also raised chrysanthemums for the fall. And so um, there was various products that they had there. And it came to a time when I was 15 years old and I really wanted a job because I really wanted to buy something. And I remember first on working on those farms especially when I started in July, it was not uncommon to see 90 degrees to 100 degree days with very high humidity. And when we'd work, we'd work all day long. This farmer had hot houses. Now what these hot houses were, very long uh, little buildings that had metal construct and they curved kind of like this and they had plastic over the top. And the purpose of that was, was so that when the sun hit it, it would be a warmer environment and so they could grow some crops before, um, uh, before summer hit. So while it was still cold in Pennsylvania, you can still grow some things in them. Well, the farmer also used them not only for growing some seeds, but he also used them for growing tomatoes even throughout the entire year. And so I remember going inside of those hot houses when it was already 100 degrees outside. And he would send me in there, and when I would go, I would go down the line picking these tomatoes, and sweat would be pouring off my body so intently, it was a steady stream coming off of my shorts as I'm picking tomatoes because it was so hot in there. I'm taking a drink every 10 minutes just so I can keep some kind of moisture inside my body. And you say, wow, why would, you, why would a 15-year-old go through all of that torture? What was so important to him? I remember uh, picking cucumbers and zucchinis and the cucumbers would have these little spikes that would embed themselves into my fingertips as I'm looking to pull back the vines to find the cucumbers. I remember zucchinis, they had spikes on the stalks and they would scrape your skin and you get all these scratches. I remember hoeing four acres of pumpkin all by myself. The farmer picked me up, dropped me off first thing in the morning, and he didn't come back till about 9, 9.30 at night. And all I did all day long was hoe the pumpkins in the hot heat. I remember picking green beans. Now, if you know anything about green beans, they're about the easiest thing in the world to grow. But when the farmer grew these green beans, he would plant an entire row about 400 feet long. Now, do the math. If you plant 400 feet long row of green beans, when they come up and it's time to harvest, do you know how many green beans there are ready to pick? That's right, every one of them. Every single plant is ready all at the same time. That means a boy wasn't just uh, 
you pick the green beans uh, an hour a day for uh, three weeks. No, you picked them all at once. When they were ready, they were ready because they went too many days past. They bulged and they got tough and they weren't worth selling anymore. And so he would send me out there picking green beans for four to six hours at a time. I'd be picking a bushel about every 45 minutes or so. And I'd be out there picking for four to six hours. And I'm going to tell you what, before I pick green beans, I could barely touch my toes. But the time I got done picking green beans, I could put my hands flat on the ground because my body had so adjusted to me leaning over for so many hours a day picking green beans. But I'm going to tell you, it was a bit painful. I remember we had to pinch mums, credenza mums. You say, what do you mean by pinching mums? Well, when you, when you plant those uh, little plants and they grow, they have buds. And if you don't pinch the buds off, you're going to get a real meager looking plant. And so when you pinch the buds off, every bud you pinch off, another two stems come off of that bud. And so we would pinch them not just once, not twice. We'd do at least three or four pinchings of the mums. And when you pinch mums, not all the buds are at the exact same height. So sometimes you got to go down further in the plant, and we had to pinch them with our fingers. Now once they got big enough and they were more rounded, we'd use some shears. But in the beginning, you just had to pinch them all with your fingers. It was long, tedious work. You say, why would a 15-year-old boy do all that work? Well, then we had the first thing we did in the morning, and that was picking corn. Picking corn always began at 6 o'clock in the morning. And when I first started picking corn, do you know what? I used to get all kinds of cuts all over my arms and shoulders because the leaves on those corn stalks are so sharp. And not only that, the farmer had sprayed chemicals on those uh, corn stalks and you would stink like the chemicals when you're done going through the corn. And not only that, there would be bugs hovering all over your head because they found something that was sweaty and something they wanted to land on and drink up the juice. And so once in a while, I'd even get stung by bees that would sleep inside of the leaves of the corn stalk, right where the leaves meet the stalk. And uh, sometimes bees would stay in there and I'd put my hand in down there to grab a, a corn, ear of corn and a bee would sting my hand. And boy, it was painful. And I would, that would begin at six o'clock in the morning. And you say, why, why would a 15 year old go through all that torture? Well, not only was the corn, but there was also the corn crew that we picked with. Now, I was the youngest. I was 15 years old. Most of the other fellows were adults, and they weren't Christian adults. They were rather crude and rude and vulgar adults. They came and they offered me cigarettes. I declined. They came and offered me alcohol. I declined. They come and they offer porn pornography, and I would decline. They were not the best type of people in the world. And since I was 15 years old and I was young, and since I didn't want to go along with their deeds that they did, they would tease me and make fun of me. It wouldn't be uncommon for them to throw ears of corn at me while I'm picking, and they would laugh amongst themselves. You say, why would a 15-year-old boy be tortured so much? What was so important to him? Well, not only was picking corn a, a chore, but I remember one morning after the corn picking crew had got done picking corn, and it was raining all morning, the farmer said, we have to pick watermelons. If I don't pick them, I'm going to have a problem with my watermelons. They're going to split. And so we went, and there was about three or four guys picking watermelons. And then there was a guy in between the bin where the watermelons go, which was in the truck, the bread truck. So imagine a white U-Haul truck. That would have been like what a bread truck looked like. And there was a bin in there, and then there was a guy at the door catching the watermelons, and then there was somebody inside the truck that was putting the watermelons in the bin. So we got three or four throwers, we got one catcher, and we got one person putting them in the bin. Do you know what I was nominated to do? Catch the watermelons. Now, I was 15 years old. Do you know those watermelons weigh average by 20 to 30 pounds a piece? That is a heavy load to catch when guys are two or three rows back and they're just vaulting the watermelons your way and you have to catch them. Now let me say it was also raining. It's hard enough to catch a watermelon by itself when you're 15 years old, but it was raining. Those watermelons were wet. The clothes I was wearing, I was wearing those yellow, uh, uh, kind of like overalls that were waterproof and with a yellow jacket that goes around. And when that's wet, that's slippery. 
So imagine trying to catch a wet watermelon with a slippery suit, and then we had these uh, black rubber boots that we wore. Now, these black rubber boots, when you're traveling around in the mud, I discovered something. When you want to move in five inches of mud, those boots don't want to move with you. They tend to stick in the mud. And I remember on one occasion I was there, I was catching the watermelons, I was doing my best, I was landing them over, and then the corn uh, pickers thought they'd get smart with me, and they threw two watermelons at me at the same time. Now I was outside of the truck. I braced myself to catch them both. And you know what? I caught them both. But you know what also happened? My whole body went back, and I did a spread eagle on the, on the mud behind me. And here I am laying covered in mud, but I got two watermelons in each arm and they aren't broken. And you say, wow, why would a 15 year old boy go through all that? You know why? Because I wanted something. Not only was the uh, watermelon a chore, but I got up every day at 4.30 in the morning, Monday through Saturday. And you say, why would a 15 year old boy, I don't know any 15 year old boy get up at 4.30 in the morning. I did. I made my own lunch. Mama didn't get up at 4.30 in the morning with me. I was on my own. I made my own lunch. I packed my own, wa uh, packed my own water and got the ice ready the night before. So I made sure I had ice cubes to fill up my gallon container that I took with me every day. And I would do this as a 15-year-old boy the entire summer. You know why? It's because I wanted to purchase something. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 23... By wisdom. Point number one is there's a purchase to make. What is this purchase the Bible talks about? It's not a purchase of a car like I wanted that I was working for when I was about to turn 16 and my dad told me I had to have enough money in order to buy this car. That's why I worked on the farm so hard for these things because I wanted to drive and I wanted to have a car of my own. Well, we find here this is something different. I'm not talking about buying a car. This is talking about buying truth. So the question is, how does this happen? How does a person go about buying truth? Because there is certainly a purchase to make. Well, I also had experience with this because when I was in ninth grade, God started working in my heart and my heart was torn. I was miserable inside and I didn't know why. I was going to a good Christian school. I was part of a good Christian family and all things would seem normal. Uh, but God had put within my heart a great dissatisfaction and there was a misery of my soul even though I did top of my class in grades, did very well in sports, did very good in music and all these things were going just fine but yet I find myself in quite depression. And so I started turning to my Bible and I'd read my Bible. But you know what? When I read my Bible, it didn't seem to help at first. I, ha I knew I had a problem at the time with anger and I would read Proverbs 25 verse 1. He who hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. And I would read that over and over and I would, I would put my head in my Bible and I would say, Lord, change me. I know this is a problem that I have, but yet even with doing that, the problem seemed to still never to go away. I would memorize the Bible verse thinking maybe that would change my life, but it still didn't change my life. Still in turmoil, I looked to God in prayer, asked him to take the misery away, but nothing seemed to change. And then I started to realize that while I was saved, my everyday living showed me to be a fake Christian. What do I mean by that? I know I was saved. I can recall the time when I trusted the Lord Jesus and called on his name to be saved. But there was a misery in my soul because God says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. And since I was his child, and since I was living for myself, he was making it known unto me, and he was chastening me because he loved me. And so God's misery that was brought into my life was for my good, but I couldn't understand it. But then I began to realize, and God showed me, that I was a fake Christian. Meaning that I knew the Bible taught you need to be humble, but I was full of pride. I knew God said, the meek shall inherit the earth, but I had quite the temper. I knew that the Bible said to be submissive to those in authority, 
but I was quite willful. I knew that the Bible said to love others, but I loved myself above all. I knew that God declares we are to have good attitudes, but I had a rotten one. And I knew that giving is God's design, but I was quite selfish. And when I started to desire then to be a genuine person, God began to change my life. I started to genuinely desire to want to be a Christian in my heart, and that began my journey in buying the truth. You see, I started looking into my Bible for all the answers of my life, not just the certain ones that were causing me trouble. When I found a commandment that I was not doing, I would pray and ask for wisdom, and then I would be determined to figure it out, and I wouldn't let it alone until I started obeying what God told us to do. And you know what? Sometimes that took a good bit of time. I remember one in particular that God tells us we're supposed to love the brethren, and I had no idea how to do that. I struggled. I said, do you, what do I say? Go up to someone and say, I love your brother. Is that saying, is that actually loving your brother from your heart? I found that I had in my heart that I had resentment towards people. I found that in my heart there were some people I really didn't want to say hi to. There were some people at my Christian school I didn't want to be around and I didn't want to talk to. I was fine passing them in the hallway and not being kind to them, even though I was a Christian. And God smote my heart and said, you're supposed to love the brethren. If you are a believer in Christ, you are to love all the brethren, not just the ones that please you. And so I said, Lord, how do I do this? And I started begging God and started asking him, how do I do this? And then some of you know I shared the story God put somebody in my life that just tormented me day and night while I was at school he was my enemy he was out to get me and the Lord through that taught me how to love and so I'd make little notes and I put it in his locker I'd be kind with him I'd sit next to him in class I would sit with him at lunchtime I'd do everything I could to spend time with him and the Lord showed me how to love but you know how that journey came it came when I realized I was not loving my brethren and I was determined that by reading the the word of God and in prayer that I was going to love those that were not lovely and finally the Lord revealed it unto me and gave me the opportunity and I got to practice actually loving the brethren the way God tells me to love them. it changed my life and you know what I found in that journey I found that the purchase of truth and seeking out the truth was all worth it. When God revealed sin to me, I would confess it to him and go to the people that I sinned against. When I was seeking the truth, when I began to witness people, I would con be confronted with so much resistance and especially those of other religion. And I can recall at one time I was witnessing to somebody and telling them they'd be born again and they were a Jehovah Witness. And you know what they told me? They told me Jesus was not God. Well, I never heard that like that. I said, what do you mean Jesus is not God? I said, who is Jesus if he is not God? And he started telling me scriptures that would cause me to doubt and wonder maybe, maybe Jesus isn't God. And so I started listening and I started talking with him. And then I'd go home and I'd say, Lord, you know, your Bible the Bible, the Word of God, is the only authority in my life, and that's what I want to follow. And so I started reading in the Bible everything God said. And I remember in prayer coming to the Lord and say, Lord, if Jesus is not God, I just want to know the truth. I want to know the truth. And I would be willing to deny what I was taught my whole life growing up if you would tell me the truth, because that's all I want to know. And with an open heart before God and desiring only to know the truth, you know what the Lord revealed unto me? He revealed unto me tenfold the knowledge I ever knew about the deity of Jesus Christ. And I could go through the word of God and you can declare without any doubt, without any certainty. And to this day, if anybody were to ever question me on the deity of Jesus Christ, I could turn to them all kinds of passages of scripture and there's no devil in hell that could convince me otherwise. You know why? Because there was a turmoil in my life and I wanted to know the truth and I went to God and he gave it to me. And the Holy Spirit of God confirmed it in my heart. And nobody's going to take that away from me. 
Then I began to seek God with my life to be totally consistent so that my heart could be assured that I was genuine. Because I wanted to be a genuine Christian, not just talk like a Christian. Well, that's the first point. There's a purchase to make. And you know what that purchase is? Truth. But secondly, I'd like you to notice there's a price to pay. You know what it says? By the truth, there's a purchase to make, but by the truth and sell it not tells me there's a price to pay when you buy something. One of those prices that you pay when you buy something is effort. Think of the farm work that I mentioned. All the sweat, all the dehydration, all the pain, all the sunburn, by the way, all the soreness, all the exhaustion, the early mornings that they would pick me up at 5.15, the farmer picked me up because I was 15. I couldn't drive yet. He picked me up at my house at 5.15 in the morning and he would drop me off, usually somewhere between uh, 9 and 10 o'clock at night. That's a long day. And with all of those, for that whole summer, I was not hanging out with friends. I was not watching any TV. I wasn't watching any movies. I didn't have time for any of that stuff. All so I could buy my first car. And I worked until I got it. You see, there was a lot of effort that was put in for me in order to purchase something. And you know, spiritually, it's much of the same way. You might have to fight through dealing with your sin. You have to fight with mistakes and embarrassments, different beliefs. But you need to work on it until you understand and you practice the truth. There takes effort for you to come to an understanding of what is absolutely true in the Word of God. Not just because someone told you, because you are sure of it by your own experience. We find not only does it take effort to pay the price, but also what also pays the price is time. Think when I was working on the farm, I was working about $5 an hour. And so I bought my first car after you pay for taxes and title and plates and all that. My first car cost me about $1,000. It was a 1984 Isuzu Impulse. Uh, it didn't go in reverse. You could use a penny to start the car because the ignition didn't require a key, even though there was a key for it. And you know what? That works out at $5 an hour. That's 200 hours of labor. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of time that had to be put in to purchase what I wanted. 15 hours a day, six days a week. And I gave up my entire summer to earn about $3,500 in two months. That's not bad for a 15-year-old boy. But when you're working 90 hours a week, it's a lot of time. Do you know spiritually... Truth does not fall down unto us all at once. It takes time. It takes lots of time to study the Bible on a particular subject. It takes a lot of time to really pray, not just the two-minute prayers that some people usher before God. It takes time to practice what you learn from God. And it takes time to develop a close relationship with someone, does it not? And so it takes time to develop that close walk with the Lord. All of that requires time. I recall when I first came to Independent Bible Church of Duryea, and it wasn't long after I was here, back from Bible College and Ambassador Baptist College, and I came to Pastor Creedmart and I said, hey, Pastor Creedmart, there's a particular subject that Ambassador did not really cover very much, and I'm wondering if you would give me a little bit of instruction about this particular topic that I don't know a whole lot about. And I was waiting to come into that office to sit down and hear him wax eloquent and tell me exactly what the Bible teaches and what my position ought to be. But you know what that guy did instead? He gave me three books to read. Did you hear me? He gave me three books to read. He didn't give me the answer. I wanted the answer, but he gave me three books to read. He knew that the rewards of truth only come to those who buy the truth. And that is by putting in time and effort of study. So that when I would be asked a question on that topic, my knowledge would have much more depth. And I would understand why I believe what I believe. Because I have heard four or five different points of view on what other people believe about the subject. 
And so in wisdom, he gave me that instruction. So number one, there is a purchase to make. Number two, there is a price to pay. But thirdly, there's a profit to be gained. All right, what is the first profit that is to be gained by seeking the truth? Well, I'm going to tell you the first profit that we really need to mention is the salvation of your soul. If you're listening here tonight and you're saying, well, I heard the gospel before. I heard that Jesus died for sinners and that he was buried and he rose again the third day and he died on the cross for my sin and other people's sins and that it's only through Jesus, not through the church, not through giving, not through mass, not through communion or anything like that. It's only through Jesus, but I'm not really sure if that's really the right way. You know what you need to do to discover the truth? You need to do the same thing. You need to put in the time and the effort to discover the truth. This is what a person did by the name of Lee Strobel. His name is just about synonymous with Christian apologetic writing. But before all of that, he was an atheist journalist with an ax to grind. His personal quest was to disprove the existence of God and thereby prove his wife wrong. Ultimately, it fired back, and he ended up becoming convinced of the historic and philosophical validity of Christianity. That journey is what he documented in 1998 with the Case for Christ. Today, a movie adaptation of the bestseller, Hitch Theaters. It was reflective of my story. My story is a love story that started with Leslie and I met when we were 14 years old and grew up together and got married young. I was an atheist. She was an agnostic. So we were uh, pretty evenly matched and happy in our marriage. And then she ends up becoming a Christian, which at first word that went through my mind was divorce. I didn't want anything to do with a Christian spouse and to set up really to investigate Christianity using my investigative background and journalism background for two reasons. One is that I did see some positive and winsome changes in her, but at the same time, I wanted to get her out of this cult because I didn't want her to change into some holy roller or something I couldn't relate to. I felt like she was cheating on me with this guy, Jesus. I, I was the man in her life, and now all of a sudden, this Jesus character, who she is looking up to and worshiping to, it felt very intrusive into our marriage, and I didn't understand any of the spiritual dimensions of it. So I finally launched an investigation to try to determine whether or not Christianity or any other world religion made sense and had any credibility. I thought I would resolve it in a weekend, but it was like a punching bag that you hit and it would bounce back. I found that I was finding answers to my questions. I was finding footprints of Jesus in, his, in history and evidence that I found compelling and surprising. I did that for almost two years. My life finally came to the point where I sat down and said a good jury reaches a verdict. I got to reach a verdict. I spent two years looking at the evidence, and in light of what I consider to be an avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully towards the truth of Christianity, I came to the conclusion that it would make more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. That's when I concluded that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but packed it up by returning from the dead. And then in John 1.12 has this sort of faith equation. Believe plus receive equals become. Through that, I realized, okay, I believe, but it's not enough to have received this gift of grace through, but it, through, this grace, through Christ. So when I took the step on November 8, 1981, then my wife's and my life began to change. Ultimately, I ended up leaving journalism, which had been my life, taking a 60% pay cut to go on staff at a church. God has taken us on all kinds of unexpected adventures ever since. And so here's a story of a man who did not believe Christianity, but 
He wanted to know the truth, and so he was determined to discover the truth. He took the time and the effort to find out what was true and what was not true, and you know what his ultimate conclusion was? It's absolutely true. Discovering the truth. Listen, if you're struggling tonight and you're not sure the Bible is the Word of God, you're not sure the Gospel, I want you to know this. In 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, the Bible says, Who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? God wants you to know the truth. John 4, verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him, listen, must worship him in spirit, means you've got to be saved and have the Holy Spirit of God in you, and in truth. The Lord invites you to discover the truth. So what question is this? If you're here tonight and you're not sure all this gospel stuff is true, what does it hurt for you to go out and discover the truth? You spend the time. You seek it out. And I know God will just reveal it unto you. How about other profit to be gained um, from buying the truth is that you'll get close unto the Lord. Let me ask you tonight, if you're saved, is the Lord your closest friend? Is he a person that you genuinely confide in? It's a very important question. If you can genuinely say yes, that's a wonderful thing. But if you're a believer here tonight and you say, well, I'm not always close to God. Listen, that means there's definitely something wrong. God wants our relationship to be close and he wants it to be genuine. Other benefits to be gained from buying the truth is that you have certainty of purpose. John 8 and verse 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We find that if you believe the truth and you gain the truth, you'll be a man or woman of conviction, and you can stand when everyone else is against you. And listen, here's the most crucial point that I believe we find in our text. If you buy the truth, then listen, the next phrase of that verse means you won't be selling the truth. What does that mean? You see, when you put so much time and effort into buying the truth, selling it is when you let go of something because it has no real value to you. Do you know there's a many a young person who has grown up in a church and as they travel all over the country, you see this in every church you go to. They may have grown up in a good Christian church, in a good Christian home, as you may say. And they've heard the teachings. They've heard the convictions that came from the pulpit. And they've heard preaching on modesty. They've heard preaching on alcohol. They've heard preaching on music. They've heard preaching on all various topics. But yet... When they are able to get on on their own, they don't follow after those things. Why is it? It's because they never bought the truth to begin with. You see, that truth was just the truth of the preacher. It was the truth of the parents. But they never put the effort and the work in themselves to discover whether or not that thing is true. You see, the more work you put into something, the more appreciation you have for it, the more value it holds. And so you don't want to get rid of it. I remember when I was playing Little League Baseball. It was my second year, and I love baseball, by the way. And so I was not the best hitter. I was scared of the ball because I got hit too many times as a young person. And so I was, uh, though, anxious in the outfielder, and I loved playing in the outfield, and the ball would get hit, and I'd do everything I could to catch that ball. And I remember one game. I was on the Atlanta Braves. I know it's not as good as the Phillies, but it's all right. I was on the Atlanta Braves team, and not the one uh, down in Atlanta, the one in Perky Omenville, Central Perk, Pennsylvania. And uh, there I was on the Atlanta Braves team, and I caught four balls that were very difficult ones to catch. Most of them were diving catches as a young kid. And my coach at the end of the game was so excited with my performance, he gave me the game ball. Now, I'm going to tell you, I never in my life had ever gotten a game ball before. And he put on it the score that was on there, and he signed it, and he had people on the team sign it, and I had that game ball. And you know what? That game ball meant everything to me because I worked so hard. 
And you know, if someone would come to me and say, hey, I'll trade you baseballs, I'd say, no way. I'm not giving that up. That baseball means something to me. I worked hard, and I earned that baseball, and I'm going to keep that baseball. You know, when you have to work hard for something, you begin to appreciate that thing that you worked so hard for. And listen, truth is the same way. These truths that so many young people throw off when they get older, I am convinced it's because they didn't put the time and the effort and the battle to discover what is genuinely pleasing unto God. And so when they get older and they say, well, you know, my friends drink, what's the big deal if I drink? They don't study it out. Listen, I have talked with them. I've talked with individuals like that. I've talked with them and I'll ask them questions and you know what? They just throw it off. They say, oh, I, I grew up that way. I, I, all that stuff is garbage. And they don't even want to debate. They don't even want to talk about it. And why? It's because they never spent the time and effort in in order for them to come to that conclusion themselves. Listen, the most important thing that you can ever buy in this world is the truth. And you only get to that by putting the time and the effort in. Listen, there is a purchase to make that purchases truth. There is a price to pay. That price is time and effort that you've got to put in. And there is a profit to be gained. That profit, number one, is the salvation of your soul. But secondly, it's the sanctification of the Spirit of God in your life. And listen, God, when you got saved, God put the Holy Spirit of God in you. And the Bible says in 1 John 2 and verse 27, For ye need that no man teach you, but the same Spirit that dwelleth in you teaches you and is of the truth and is not a lie. And when you get saved, God takes the Word of God, and with the Spirit of God, He applies that truth to your heart. Listen, a pastor or an evangelist can only preach to the head. It takes the Holy Spirit of God to reach the heart. And you got to go to God in His Word, and you got to go with the Holy Spirit, and you got to say, Lord, whatever you show me, I will do it. And you need to purchase the truth. You need to put the time and effort in. And listen, if you do... The Apostle John said the greatest joy that he could ever imagine this side of eternity. Boy, it's got to be big. He said in 3 John and verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. He didn't say that he walked in my footsteps. He didn't say that they walk in accordance to the teachings of the Apostle Paul. No. I have no greater joy than to see that they walk in the truth. Let me ask you tonight. Are you buying the truth or are you selling the truth? That's our word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time this evening. We pray you would work in hearts. We pray you work in the hearts of the lost that are not certain of the gospel and the validity of the gospel. Lord, may they seek the truth with all of their hearts. And then, Lord, for the believers, let us not rest easy while we be in Zion, but, Lord, we are soldiers of the cross, and we need to be out there buying up the truth every day and wisdom and instruction and understanding. Lord, help us to seek out Bible answers for every difficulty we come up against. So, Lord, that we will be individuals who buy the truth and sell it not. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.